Billy and, <laughs> and uh, Crystal so much. Uh, they fed some good food, and I know whether Patrick was saying that I need to fill out an evaluation form <laughs> as to who had the best meal. And man, uh, there's old expressions, but Patrick, Mama ain't raised no food, so uh, no better than to do something like that. I'm just gonna tell you every last thing that I put in my mouth this week has been absolutely wonderful. And we appreciate that so very much, you guys taking care of us the way that you have. And, and we just uh, love you guys so much already. Uh, as Brother Rick mentioned, man, we've admired one another for a very long time. Appreciate him so very much, Simona, and the work that they have done uh, in the Lord for so very long. And, and I just appreciate the, the kind and warm introduction. Uh, very, very flattering. Thank you so much, Brother. I love you dearly. And that's what we want to talk about tonight just a little bit. I had another sermon I want to preach on tonight, but sometimes uh, you get some thoughts rolling and change course a little bit. Brother Rick and I have been uh, working on his radio program, and he's been so kind as to allow me to sit in with him for the last couple of days, and I really enjoyed that. He's talking about the, the seven virtues, sometimes people call them the seven graces, seven objectives of the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5, down to around verse number 8. And of course, how the Bible lets us know that our faith is a foundation of sorts. Whenever we uh, begin to walk as the apostles walked, and of course, Peter begins by saying that he's writing to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. And that terminology in the Greek language literally means a, a faith that is identical to that of the apostles and equally as precious as theirs is. Once we have, have begun to do that, that is the foundation of that God has set before us, but then he tells us that we need to build up on that foundation. And so around verse number 4 and 5, he says, besides all of this, uh, let us be diligent to add to our faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience brotherly kindness. And today we looked at or patience godliness, and rather than to godliness, brotherly kindness. And that's what we focused on today. And so as we were studying together with those who were listening in, I was just thinking about the idea of brotherly kindness, and I, I said, well, that's the direction we'll go tonight. Uh, definitely, we talk about developing a strong heart. I think that's one of the great provisions that God has made for us in being able to do such is the camaraderie that we have together as children of God. The Bible says we are a family, and we have noted that this week already, and we will continue to reiterate or emphasize that beautiful truth that we are the household of God. When Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, I write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly, but if I tell you long, some translations say, if I'm delayed, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself. In the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth, the house of God, the church of God, we are God's family, the Bible says. One of the things we pointed out on the radio program on this morning it's places like Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Man, is that not a, an amazing concept? That's right. That our God, our creator, where the Bible says the Lord created us. John chapter 1, verse number 3. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 15 and 16. He's not ashamed to call us his brother. And so not only is he our king, he's our savior, he is our redeemer, he's our creator, he's our brother, and God is our father. And we all together are a brother in the family of Christ. And again, that's so very important to the strengthening that we receive in this life that allows us to continue to move forward, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as Paul encourages us to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 58. When I consider uh, this loving relationship that we share in Christ and this fellowship that we enjoy as children of God, one of the books of the Bible that comes to my mind most readily is the book of Philippians. And in particular, the second chapter. And whenever Paul writes the Philippian letter, one of the things he says at the very outset is, I, I thank my God upon every remembrance, remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, make a request for you all for the fellowship that we enjoy in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul says that the fellowship that we enjoy is one of the first things on the top of my list that I give God thanks for. Whenever I consider you, the Philippian brethren, and I begin to get on my knees and to petition the throne of heaven on our behalf, I thank God for the fellowship that we enjoy. We look at Christian relationships and how important are they to this walk, this journey that we're on. And I would say they are at the very top of the list of this journey. Christian relationships, the fact that we're able to rally around one another, the fact that we're able to be friends. 
with one another, brethren, together. As we were talking this morning again on the radio program, one of the things we, we mentioned was the Greek word that is translated brotherly kindness or brotherly love, and that is the word uh, uh, Philadelphia. And as Rick pointed out so very aptly and so very eloquently this morning, is a lot of times when we look at those Greek words, they are combinations of two words in the Greek, or compound terms. And so phila, which is brotherly affection, or excuse me, affection, a type of love that is an affectionate type of love. And then alphos means brother in the Greek language. And so we put those words together, it's brotherly affection. And so it's different from agape love in a sense in that this is a love that talks about the affectionate friendship that we share together. And so how important is that? That as we function as God's family, that not only do we enjoy and relish in the fraternity that we have as, as joint members of God's family, but also we ought to be friends. We ought to have a warm affection for one another. That's the way Christianity, Christianity is supposed to be. Not supposed to be cold. Not supposed to be heartless. Not supposed to be overly technical. My friends, we're a family. We ought to love each other. And that's exactly what Paul begins to talk about when he looks at the Christian relationship in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 1, down to verse number 7. And so that will be our focus for our expository thoughts on tonight. Again, the Philippian letter is a letter on which the, perhaps the thematic thrust of it is the joy of Christianity. How do we know that? We know that because 18 times in just four chapters, Paul will utilize two words in the Greek language which translate roughly joy or rejoice. So just four chapters, 18 times, he uses those terms, joy and rejoice. Power and kakamon in the Greek language are those two words. And so again, he uses them over and over again repeatedly. As a matter of fact, in chapter 4, verse number 4, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. And so this is undoubtedly the theme of the Philippian epistle, is the joy of Christianity. We understand that we can join Christianity according to what Paul has to say in chapter 1 because Christ is the, pur is the purpose of our lives. In chapter 1, verse number 21, he lets us know that, that uh, for, for me to, to live is, is, or to die is gain, to live is Christ rather than to die is gain. And so Paul says, he makes an amazing statement there, for me to live is Christ. Christ is the very purpose of my life, I believe, is what Paul is trying to communicate in that particular statement. That's a statement that's given a lot of scholars and commentators a, a whole lot of problems. Whenever you read on what they write, it's very hard for them to, to be able to expound upon that phrase or that statement. I think Paul is saying that my life is all about Christ. My life is wrapped up in Christ. I think Galatians chapter 2. In verse number 20, kind of gives us some insight. Brother Johnny Ranch used to always say that the Bible is his own best commentary. And so Paul over there talks about being crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For me to live is Christ. And so the joy of Christianity comes from the fact that Christ is our purpose in life, but in the second place, because Christ is our pattern of life. In chapter 2, verse number 5, the Bible tells us, Paul is encouraging us to have within us the mind that is also in Christ Jesus. As we get into that text in just a moment, we'll find out that, that Christ is set up as the epitome of what Paul expects us to be, and that makes all the sense in the world. We are to be like Christ. Paul teaches us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1, would be imitators of God as his dear children. And so Christ always is the ultimate example for you and me of everything that God the Father expects us to be. That's part of the reason that he came to this earth to become an example for you and me, to follow in his footsteps. But then in the third place, we understand that we are to, uh, to relish in Christianity and we can really come to appreciate the joy of Christianity by understanding that Christ is the prize of life. That's chapter 3. So in chapter 3, beginning in verse number 3, Paul goes on to talk about some of his credentials, if you will, and he's not doing that in a boasting manner, but he's talking about those who would boast in their Jewish credentials. And he would say, look, if any other man has a reason to boast in his Jewish credentials, man, I got more so. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, as touching the righteousness that is in the law. He says, I'm blameless. But notice verse number 7. But what things were gained to me, these have I come at loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ. What does Paul want to win? Christ. And so Christ is our prize in life. And then, of course, we know that we can manifest or see the manifestation of the joy of Christianity is in the fact that Christ is the power of life. Philippians 4, verse number 13. Perhaps you're familiar with that passage of Scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so the joy of Christianity is what it's all about. And again, let's go back to chapter 2. And now let's narrow our focus a little bit to chapter 2 and to the first seven verses of that beautiful chapter, first eight verses of that beautiful chapter, and we began to, to look at the idea of the Christian relationship. And here's what we're going to see. We're going to see four things on tonight from this passage of Scripture. We're going to see the design for Christian relationships. Number one, we're going to see the demand of Christian relationships in the second place. We're going to see the details of Christian relationships, number three. And then finally, we'll see the demonstration of Christian relationships. And so, number one, we see the we see the details, or excuse me, the design rather of Christian relation. What is designed into the relationship that God has developed for you and I to share? God established the church, and again, the church is His family, and the church is comprised of people. How many times have you heard people make that statement? The church is comprised of people. It's not the building that surrounds us or houses us tonight, but it is you and me. We are the church of Christ, and so the church is comprised of people. And as such, God has, has given us instruction as to how we are to relate one to another. And when you look at verse number one, he says this, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, if you my joy that you like mine, having the same love, you know, one accord of one mind. Now we look to through to, chapter, uh, to verse number two, but I want us to stop at verse number one. And so there are five things there. The Bible says that the Lord has designed into Christian relationships. My friends, I want to suggest to you tonight that these things are so very important that in fact they're absolutely indispensable, indispensable to our, our walk with Christ. They are absolutely vital to our eternal future. And we cannot gloss over these things. We cannot dismiss them. But we need to make sure that we understand them. That's what we will endeavor to do tonight. And then make sure, as our brother prayed tonight, that we apply them to our lives. The lesson tonight is intellectual, but we want it to be applicable as well. And so we want to learn some things, but not just for the sake of an academic exercise. We want to take these things and learn how to apply them to life if we're not already. And if we are already, as we talked about with Brother Rick this morning, he went over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and, and talked about the fact that Paul tells the Thessalonian congregation concerning brotherly love. You don't have any need that I write unto you. You've already been taught of God to love one another, and you do, you're do doing so very well. I only encourage you to abound more and more. And so if you're already doing these things, we just encourage you tonight to abound more and more. But first of all, Paul says if there is any consolation in Christ. We're going to look at some words tonight. And I hope it doesn't become cumbersome to your mind. I hope that we'll be able to take some time just to, to let these things soak in and understand what they mean. But he says, number one, if there be any consolation in Christ. And so that word consolation is a word paraklesis in the Greek language. It comes again from two Greek words, power and kaleo. And here's what those words mean. The word para, the preposition that means beside. Kaleo means to call. And so then you understand that word literally means to call beside or to call to one side. And so the Bible says if there be any consolation in Christ, and whenever it begins with that term, if, that doesn't mean that, well, this might be the case. It's what's called a first-class condition in the Greek language, and it, it, it could just re more readily be translated since. Since there is consolation in Christ. What are our Christian relationships consist of? Consolation in Christ. You're in Christ, and I'm in Christ. 
Whenever you are in trouble, whenever you are having problems, whenever life is becoming burdensome to you, it is my duty to call you to my side. Mm. To call you to my side. You know, the Bible lets us know that the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. <coughs> or one place like the book of John, chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. And what is Christ telling his apostles? He says, I'm about to go. I'm about to fulfill the work that the Lord has given me to fill on this earth. I'm going back to heaven. But guess what? We're not, we're not going to leave you alone. We're going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that he is the comforter or the paraclete. He is one that God is going to send to your side to take care of you when I'm gone. And that was comforting to the apostles to know that they won't, wouldn't be left alone. And again, not only is that something that God did for them, that's something that he has designed into Christian relationships that we ought to exercise one with another. Man, it should never be the case that anybody is suffering in the Lord's church. Anybody is having hardship in the Lord's church. Anybody is experiencing emotional trauma in the Lord's church by themselves. That should never be the case. It should never be the case. And we ought to love each other enough. And here's something. We ought to take enough interest in one another's lives mm -hmm. to understand what is going on one with another. You know, one of my, my dear friends here tonight, Sister Amanda Stephanus, and her husband is, is uh, one of my best friends on the planet. And she's like a daughter to my wife. I mean, we've known her since she was a little bitty. We were her counselors out of camp, and so watching her run around, and, and her and her twin sister, and, and just uh, playing ball and doing all the things that, that we did together. And so when she gets a little bit older and gets married, well, you know, we're obviously taking the very great interest in who she marries, and we get to meet her husband, and he's a wonderful man, and he's become one of my closest friends. The man has been many times where we call each other on the phone, and we're experiencing hardships in the ministry, and man, just giving each other a word of consolation, just giving each other a word of comfort, and I'm calling him to my side when he's going through troubles in the ministry, which, you know, that, that happens to us as preachers sometimes, other brother, it's time to experience troubles. In the ministry, and whenever I go through saying, he's called me to a sign. You know, there's a lot of preaching students in here tonight. Make sure that you understand that. And make sure that you learn to cherish that truth. Make sure that you develop those relationships so that you can call one another to each other's side. And not just the preachers, the elders, and everybody else in the Lord's body. Make sure that you are willing to do that. Call one another to your side whenever they need you. And so the first part of that design, that fivefold design, is paraclesis, consolation. To be there for any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love. Here's another word, paramuthion in the Greek language. So again, power of the side, muthos, to speak. And so literally, it means to speak beside. And so not only is it the case that I need to call you, just call you to my side for comfort, but I also need to be able to call you to my side and be able to speak to you in an intimate fashion, words of comfort, consolation, of encouragement, and exhortation. That's so very important to us, isn't it? And to be able to have someone to, to tell you, hey, sometimes just, just I love you. See what you're going through. We care for you. If there's anything we can do for you, we're right here for you. That's what that word embodies, being able to, to give someone a gentle word of exhortation or encouragement. My friends, even when sometimes we have brothers and sisters that might be in error, we're still called to do the exact same thing. Call them and, and speak to them a gentle word of, of admonition, if that's what duty entails. And so, and get in the word of God, study it, understand the things there that are comforting to us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse number 4, if there's comfort in God's word, whatsoever things are written aforetime. And Paul, from his perspective, is talking about the Old Testament scriptures, but from our perspective, we know that encompasses all of the scriptures. Whatsoever things are written aforetime are written by our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And we go to Psalms, we find some wonderful words of comfort there. David was going to do some things in life when he wrote a lot of the Psalms, wasn't he? And so it, it behooves us to, to familiarize ourselves with those things. So maybe I can and call my brother right to my side and say, hey, look, man, have you considered Psalm 33? Man, take a look at that psalm, man. It'll do you some good. And take a look at Psalm chapter 23. You know, that'll, that'll be uh, advantageous to you. 
And so paramuthion is number two, uh, the, the idea of calling someone close to me so that I can speak to them, intimate words of consolation or encouragement. So if they're there for any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, and the fellowship of the Spirit. And so we know this term, don't we? That's the term koinonia in the Greek language. And what it literally means is joint participation in a common endeavor. That's what we are as children of God, those who are joined together in joint participation in a common endeavor. At least we, at least we certainly should be. And so we think about the endeavors that, that make up Christianity. My friends, we're talking about worshiping God together. We are to be joint participants in this common endeavor. That's why it's so important whenever the preachers and the elders begin to talk about being in worship service, it's not just because they want to harp or complain or don't have anything better to talk about. But guess what, my friends? We are joint participants in a common endeavor. And so whenever the church is worshiping our God, you are supposed to be there. You're supposed to be by one another's side. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 emphasizes this truth. The Bible says, let us consider one another in order to provoke one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as it matters of uh, some ends. And so again, when we come together to worship, predominantly our aim and endeavor is to glorify and venerate the God of heaven. But the Bible says there's also a secondary or a horizontal benefit that comes from our worship together. And so joint participants in a common endeavor. What else are we to be doing as the Lord's church? We're to be evangelizing, striving to lead others to Christ through the proclamation of the gospel, through the lives that we live. And so whenever there are evangelistic efforts, excuse me, that are put forth, if you're a member of the Lord's body, you ought to be involved in them in some shape, form, or fashion. We're joint participants in a common endeavor. You know, we have campaigns, and uh, I'm like Brother Rick, man, he likes evangelistic work, and I do as well. And so uh, we have all types of campaigns uh, that we are involved in. When we were at Kendall, Louisiana, my wife and I, for 13 years, we had two campaigns a year. Every year that we were there, big campaigns. And uh, you know, Amanda and, and her sisters would come down for one the first year that we were there. And so we'd spend a whole week going out and knocking the doors of the community, trying to set Bible studies, encourage people to give a listening ear to the soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ is something that we would always emphasize is, look, if you can't get out there and physically walk from house to house, don't worry. There's something that you can do. And we, you know, we're not naive. We understand there are some people who have reached the age where they can't walk from door to door in the neighborhood all day long. We know some people have other conditions that will prevent them from being able to do that. But guess what? You can do something. You know, we'd have, you know, one brother had knee surgery, and so he had loaded up his trunk with waters. And he's driving around to all the various teams, man, taking them water to make sure that they're hydrated as we're knocking doors in the sun. We had some people that would come up just to pray with the entire group before we went out, man. And they were able to come and pray and went back home after that. And that is so very encouraging. It shows us that they're all in. They are joint participants in this common endeavor. Look at the New Testament scriptures and look at all of the various beautiful contributions that men and women made to the success of the Lord's church. And there's so many things that are being done. And we look at, you know, Dorcas and on what she was doing from a domestic standpoint. We look at uh, the, the wonderful hospitality that was exhibited uh, by uh, uh, you know, Lydia over in Acts chapter 16, we look at all of the things that were done, the letter that's transferred by Sister Phoebe. Uh, we, we look at all of these things that are being done, all of the brothers and the contributions that, are, that they are making. That's the way that it's supposed to be. So much for us to do in the Lord's body. We're joint participants in a common endeavor. There be any, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. I love this one. If there be any affection, the King, the King James Version says any bowels and mercy. And that's a very interesting term. We wouldn't utilize that terminology <laughs> in our common day vernacular, but we might use the term intimate affection. And that's really what the word encompasses in the Greek language. The word splotnon, it talks about inward feelings. Inward feelings. And the Bible says that ought to be present in our relationship together as children of God. I mean, we ought to have inward feelings 
for one another? That sounds kind of mushy. Well, yeah, maybe so, but that's all right. That's what it's supposed to be. Matter of fact, you look at Paul in this very letter, and you go over to chapter 1, and he begins to talk about the fact that he longed to be with the Philippian congregation. He says, I got you in my heart and in my mind. You're in my thoughts. I long to be with you. Well, Paul, that sounds mushy. Well, maybe it does. But that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. That I want to be with them. Always try to demonstrate or illustrate that word spot now. Very interesting word by thinking about a courtship period. Right now, my wife's glad at it. She knows uh, illustrations coming in and holds her. And, and uh, she always tells me, don't use her as illustrations, but uh, hadn't figured out how not to do that yet. <laughs> So, I think about the term spot night, and the word literally is the whole idea of, again, of kind of having butterflies within affection. And so, I remember whenever we were recording at the University of Oklahoma, and then I met her about the third weekend. And so, you know, you go in with all these visions of grandeur, man, I'm going to go to campus, and I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Well, man, I met her the third week, and a lot of those ambitions come to a screeching halt because a lot of my focus was on her from that point. But we fell in love and we began to court. And man, that, those feelings of butterflies that you have, man, you guys know what, what I'm talking about if you've been in love. Those feelings of butterflies. Uh, you know, Amanda, we were talking to her about when she and Mornay were courting. Mornay's from South Africa. And so our times are very, very different. And so she said, you know, I knew that I was falling in love when I would find myself staying up until about 3 o'clock in the morning so I could talk to him when he was getting up, and so, yeah, I would say that was indicative of being alone. Mm -hmm. You staying up till 4 o'clock in the morning and talk to somebody on the other side of the world. And so, and, and so that's kind of what the, what is entailed in that idea of the word sure. plot not and inward affection that I have. It's not just the case that you're my brother and I got to be with you. You're my brother and I want to be with you. Right. I love you. I can't wait till we get to be together. You know, I, I've known Brother Rick for a very long time, and there was a great anticipation to be able to come here to Nesbitt, Mississippi, and to be able to work together with Ian and Sister Mona and to get to meet all of you guys. And, and now not only do we long for them, but we long for you as well whenever our time here is over. And we look very forward to the next time we can be together again. But that's what that word entails. Affection and mercy, or teramas. And that is kindness in relieving the want of another. That word is, is to me embodied and encapsulated in the example that we see in the early church after it's established. You go over to Acts chapter 2, and we visit this passage a little bit, but I want you to go over there again. And of course, we know that verse number 41, we see the baptisms of some 3,000 people. They are added by God to the church of Christ. The Bible teaches us that they would continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. The Bible mentions, once you get down to verse number 44, that all who believed were together. And listen to this very carefully, brethren. They had all things common. Now, I know if you're looking at some other translation than the King James, perhaps something like the New King James or whatever, which is a good translation as well. It'll have the word in in the English translation. They had all things in common. But that's not what the Greek says. The Bible says in the Greek they had all things common. Common. It's not a prepositional phrase there. They had all things common. What that means is everything that they had, they shared one with another. What I had didn't simply belong to me. It was Brother Alex's as well, if he needed it. What Brother Alex had didn't simply belonged to him. You know, it was Brother Billy's if he needed it. What Brother Billy has, and what Sister Crystal has, doesn't just belong to them. It belongs to Brother Trey and his family if they need it. That's the idea there. And that's the word for tiramos, kindness and relieving the want of one another. And so the Bible says they had all things common and they sold their possessions and goods and they parted them, the possession, the, the proceeds unto all men as every man had need. You go to chapter 4, verse 34, 35, you see the exact same thing there. There was need, neither was there any that wanted for anything, but as many as had uh, houses and lands, they sold them. They brought the proceeds, they laid them down at the apostles' feet. The apostles made distribution as every man had need. 
And so the church loved one another and they were taking care of the needs one of another. And that's what we ought to be doing in the Lord's body today as well. What needs are there that exist among us? I'm not saying necessarily that we live in a time and in a, a context where we have to go and sell things in order to provide for others. I mean, if duty called, we probably should do that. But there are other ways that we certainly ought to be taking care of one another. You know, we got some, some sisters that from time to time we might need somebody to mow the lawn or to clean the gutters. Are we willing to go and to tend to their needs? All right, we got people that might you know, be sick and they might need some food taken to them. Are we willing to exhibit the effort to tend to that need? We should, because that's worked into the design of Christianity and of Christian relationships. And so that's what Paul tells us here. There be therefore a consolation in Christ, being comfort and love, being fellowship of the Spirit, being affection and mercy. Now here's the demand in point number two. Fulfill ye my joy. That to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. What is Paul calling for there? What is he demanding that our Christian relationships involve? He says again, fulfill my joy that to be like-minded. Number one, unity of mind. Unity of mind. Your God actually expects that of us as his children, <laughs> that we all think the same way. That's where doctrinal matters are concerned, religious matters are concerned. We ought to think that there's really no provision or no space in Christianity for uh, you know, one brother or sister thinking this, holding this doctrine concerning divorce and marriage, and this brother holds this doctrine concerning divorce and marriage. Let me bring it closer to home. There's really no place in Christianity for today for one particular congregation holding this view of worship and how it is to be conducted, and another congregation holding this view of worship and how it is to be conducted. One congregation says, we can do virtual worship. Another congregation says, well, that's not what I read in the Bible. The Bible says we are to literally have corporate, in-person worship. we got to divide in the Lord's church right now. It should not be there, my friends. We should all be thinking the same thing. We ought to be like-minded. And here's what we ought to be able to do. We ought to be able to open up God's Word and see what it says and comply with it. That's something we've always prided ourselves in in the Church of Christ, right? Is being able to open up God's Word and do what it says. We speak where the Bible speaks, right? We're silent where the Bible is silent. But all of a sudden, oh, Mr. Coronavirus comes into the equation and now we've got some different ideas, ideas that have been very different from anything that we've ever embraced in our lifetime and different from what the church has embraced for 2,000 years because it's different than what we see written in the pages of the book. And I don't care what it is, disease, famine, persecution, there's been nothing that God has allowed to change his dictates concerning how we worship him. Right. Nothing. My friends, we don't experience anything like what the church experienced in the first century. I'm not seeing my brother have his head severed from his body like John did. I'm not seeing my brother stoned to death like Stephen was. I'm not witness any of those things. It's very unlikely that I will, thank God. But even in those strenuous times and circumstances, God never rearranged what he expected of the church concerning worship. Oh yeah, there's a present distress that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but what does he say in regards to the present distress? Go to virtual worship? That's not what he said. The only thing he says in response to that is, maybe you shouldn't marry. That's the only thing he says. Probably be better for you not to marry right now because of the persecution that the church is facing. Who wants to see a wife Martyred. Who wants to see a husband martyred? Who wants to see their children crucified? And so it might be better for you not to marry under the present circumstances, but he never says, guess what? You know, don't worship. Don't worship. I want you to stay at home instead of coming together collectively, like the Bible tells us to in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Acts chapter 20, because of present stress. We ought to be thinking the same, my friends. I, I, I'm saying that, and I know. That's not a message that's popular right now in the Lord's body. But we ought to be thinking the same way. There should not be a schism in the Lord's church right. or a chasm or disruption over coronavirus. 
And it's, it's, it's disheartening, to be honest. And it's compromised so many Christian relationships. Brethren who were tight, who were close, who were on the same page, who we spoke on each other's lectureships, who we went to one another's gospel meetings, and now all of a sudden we can't go to each other's gospel meetings over coronavirus? All of a sudden we can't speak on each other's lectureship over coronavirus? Man, the church needs to step back and think about what in the world we're doing right now. Man, have we bumped out our heads? Have we gone crazy? The Bible says the demands of Christian relationships are that we think the same way. That we be like-minded. You know, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. Paul says, I beseech you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that you speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Do you realize that our judgment concerning how we how we handle COVID-19 should be exactly the same? That's what the book says. If I'm wrong, somebody points it out to me. Paul says, I'm begging you by the authority of Christ that you speak the same thing. That there's no division among you, but to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. Hmm. If it seems like I'm passionate about this, it's probably because I am. <laughs> probably because I am. And I'm fed up hmm. with dealing with this stuff. I mean, we're going to let a threat of a virus, a possibility, a mind possibility of contracting the virus. We want to allow that to divide the Lord's church. I think the Lord is, is greatly disappointed in heaven right now. I really do. How could he not be? He died for our unity. It's a part of what he designed for Christian relationships. So the demands are, number one, that we be like-minded. Likeness of mind. But in the second place, in verse number two, we see the reciprocation of love. That's the second thing in Christian relationships. Demand of us. We ought to love one another reciprocally. We ought to have the same love one for another, my friends. I ought to love you with everything that I got. We know that's required, right? Whenever that lawyer comes to Christ and he tempts him by asking him what is the greatest commandment, of course, all the Lord will respond. I should love the Lord by God for all that heart, soul, and mind. It's the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a general term, love your neighbor. Matter of fact, we go over to Luke chapter 9, he helps uh, to understand, me, Luke chapter 10, he helps to, us to understand that our neighbor is a very comprehensive concept. Because remember that guy that, that then goes over there and says, you know, uh, you know, Lord, uh, I know the greatest commandment is we're to love God with all our hearts, all our mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And Christ says, that's exactly right. You do that, you'll be fine. And then here comes the kicker. Well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> so he's willing to love his neighbor as long as he gets, gets to pick who his neighbor is. <laughs> that's when we have the story of the Good Samaritan. You know that's the backdrop to that story. A guy wanted to be able to determine of his own accord who his neighbor was. And Christ says, hmm, here's something for you to think about. And at the end, he asked, who's the, who, who was the good neighbor in that story? Who's the neighbor in that story? The Samaritan was. A person that you would regard as your neighbor. But that's who your neighbor is. And so it's a very comprehensive term. So the Bible teaches us that we have to love our neighbors as ourselves. And let me put this on your mind. How much more so should we love our brethren mm. as ourselves? What does Christian relationships demand of us? Demands likeness of mind. It demands reciprocation of love. And we ought to be loving one another with everything that we've got. With every ounce of our being. We ought to love one another. And our spiritual family ought to even take precedence over our biological family. It's a beautiful blessing when they're both one and the same. It's a beautiful blessing that my biological family is also my spiritual family. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. 
And Jesus Christ sets the precedent for us whenever the, he's in the, in the house teaching. And they come and knock on the door. It's his mother and his sisters, brothers. Hey, and can somebody relay the message? Your family's out here. They want to see you. And what was Christ's response? Who is my mother? Who are my sisters? Who are my brothers? Those who do the will of my father, which is in heaven. He elevated to the position of top priority our spiritual family. And we ought to love one another fervently. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, with a pure heart, fervently. We ought to love one another. Go to the book of 1 John sometime and study that and see what kind of precedent the Bible sets in talking about the love that we have one for another. How important is the love that we are to have one for another? When you go to 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says, you cannot love God in heaven whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother and who you see day by day. It's an impossibility, my friends. Or in the book of 1 John chapter 3, the Bible talks about around verse 14, 15, and 16, the fact that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to also lay down our lives for the brethren. That's the magnitude of love that we are to have one for another. You ever think about loving your brother along those lines? Probably not very often, do you? And would you lay down your life for your preacher, for your brother in Christ? He needed you too. You lay down your life for the elders and their families that, that was needed. Elders, would you lay down your life for this flock? They needed you too. And I hope we can all answer that question in the affirmative. We to love one another. That's what Christian relationships demand of us. So it demands likeness of mind, reciprocation of love. For being my joy to be like mine, have the same love in a one accord of one mind. It also demands unity of direction, doctrine, and duty. We ought to be one. One accord, the Bible says. And how many times do we see that terminology? Acts 2, verse number 46. And they're all in one accord, the Bible says. One accord. And God always expects us to be of one accord. We need to be going in the same direction. And of course, the Bible determines what that direction is. Not a mystery. We don't get together in some back room and decide what our purpose is going to be. God's already set our purpose for us. And he's already set our direction in front of us. We just do what the Bible says. We want to do what the scriptures say in this regard. We ought to be one. There ought to be a unity of doctrine. Again, we ought to teach exactly the same thing on any given subject in the Bible. Care for divorce and remarriage. We ought to be saying the exact same thing. How many decades has it been, Brother Billy, since the church has been disputing the subject of divorce and remarriage? Why? Why? You got a different Bible up in the Northeast than we got down in the Southeast? You got a different Bible out there on the West Coast than they have in the Midwest? There are different Bible in the South? There are different Bible in America than there is in England? Why in the world would we possibly teach anything different concerning this subject matter? Why would it be the case that in generations past there have been debates between brethren over the subject of divorce and remarriage? Why would that be the case? I would hold a new power have debated James Maxwell back in the day over divorce and remarriage. We should be saying the exact same thing then. Why would Thomas B. Warren have debated Edward Fuqua? way back in the day. They should have been saying the same things. Back in the matter is that some of us who are going to say what the Bible says and some who won't. That's the problem. <laughs> that is the problem. Mm -hmm. But we ought to be saying the same thing. There ought to be a unity of direction, a unity of doctrine, a unity of duty. We're trying to do the same thing to get to the same place, and that's heaven. And so we see then the details of Christian relationships, number one. In verse number one, in verse number two, we see the demands of Christian relationships. And then in verse number three, we see the, in verse number four as well, the details of Christian relationships. Well, how can we accomplish what Paul is telling us to accomplish? <laughs> now, we're to be one. We're to be on one page as God's children. Man, we're to have a mutual respect and love for one another. How do we accomplish that? I love verse three and four. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. 
the New King James Version says, strife or vain glory. The King James Version says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's how you accomplish the unity that God is calling for. That's how you manifest the love the Christian relationships demand. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. I believe firmly that the root of all sin is selfishness. Mm -hmm. Really do. I want you to go back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to go forward through the entire Bible. And I want you to name you one sin that is recorded in Holy Writ. It was not done out of the motivation of selfishness. There's not one. You saw the fruit. It's pleasant for the eyes. Good for food. Tree did desire to make one wise. She took over the fruit there and did eat. Gave it to her husband. And he did eat. First sins that are ever committed are committed out of selfishness. God told them what to expect or what he expected of them. They did what they wanted to do. Selfishness. Any sin that I've ever committed in my life, the motivation has been selfishness. Any sin that you've ever committed in life, the motivation has been selfishness. I say something to my spouse, I shouldn't say selfishness. I disrespect my parents the way I should. Selfishness. I go somewhere I shouldn't go. Selfishness. I watch something that I shouldn't watch. Selfishness. I listen to what I shouldn't listen to. Selfishness. I think what I should not think. Selfishness. And there are not many sins that we can commit that don't also affect other people around us adversely. And so understand then, and how do we maintain the unity of the spirit? How do we maintain the like-mindedness, the love that God demands of Christian relationships? Number one, selflessness. Selflessness. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, meekness, or conceit. I need to be meek. I need to be humble. Man, that's disruptive to our relationships when one of us, or both of us for that matter, cannot figure out how to humble ourselves. I want it my way, and that's, that's the way I gotta have it, and, and I don't care what you think or how you feel. Seeing the body of Christ ruptured because of pride and egotism. It should never be. It should never be. When it comes to doctrinal matters, there really shouldn't be any discussion. The Bible says what it says. When it comes to matters of expedience, then I want to humble myself and give way to whatever it is that that you think sometimes, how you feel. We're talking about it matters of expediency, not doctrinal matters. Matters of opinion. I ought to consider you. My pride shouldn't be so big and my ego so grand that I think your idea amounts to nothing and mine is the best thing since sliced bread, as they say. Sliced brisket would be better for me. <laughs> right? Sliced bread is what they usually say. All right? And so... <laughs> We gotta make sure that we are selfless and that we are meek, the Bible says. In lowliness of mind, esteem or exalt others above ourselves. Here's something that I know for sure. You know, Rick and I will never have a problem with one another. If I'm always exalting him above me, and he's always exalting me above him, we'll never have any problem, I guarantee you. How can you have a problem with somebody that exalts you above themselves? Who considers you above themselves? How can you have a problem with that person? You wouldn't. You love them. You cherish them. That's how Christian relationships are supposed to work. The Bible says, look not every man on his own interest, but also every man on the interest of others. Consider one another. Their thoughts, their ideas, their feelings, their sentiments. You ought to care about one another in that manner and in that fashion. And so we see 
So we have the details of Christian relationships. And then finally, we see the demonstration of Christian relationships. Jesus Christ is the epitome, the way that he entered into a relationship with you and me. That ought to be our model of what our relationships ought to be one to another. Let's just mind me, he says in verse number five, there's also in Christ Jesus. For being in the form of God, do not consider his quality with God, the thing he grasped. The American Standard Version says. But he made himself with no reputation, says the King James Version, says he emptied himself, the American Standard. And the word in the Greek language is from a derivative of kenosis, which literally means an emptying, a pouring out. So the Bible says Christ poured himself out. He is equal to God the Father. He is God eternal. We have the Council of Nicaea back in 325 AD. And you know what the subject matter was? Is the Son, is Jesus Christ eternal as the Father? Is he God? Is he deity like the Father is? And very fortunate on that particular occasion, you know, some of the denominational people getting together, you know, what would be the, the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church, but but they had the right idea, and they said, let's look at what the Bible says. Some of them did. Let's look at what the Bible says. There's Anastasia and Arioch, and on two opposite sides of the spectrum. And one says, Jesus Christ, no, he's created being. The other one's saying, no, he's eternal like the Father. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says he's every bit as eternal as the Father. Okay. Remember, we talked about Micah chapter 5, verse number 2 the other day, when it talks about Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of these shall come forth him unto me that shall be king or ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old, even from everlasting. Jesus Christ is eternal. In the book of Psalm chapter 45, the Bible refers to him as God. In Psalm chapter 110, the Bible refers to him as God. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, the Bible calls him God. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible calls him God. In Romans chapter 9, he's called God. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. God. And the Bible says that God emptied himself. He deprived himself of the glory that he had with the Father for the world was. He deprived himself of the position that he shared with the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. He deprived himself. And he came down and he subjected himself, the Bible says in the next verse, to God. He made himself of no reputation took on the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of a man, the Bible says, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ did that for you and me. See, Paul was talking about our Christian relationship, and he ultimately concludes this thing with Jesus Christ. He is our example. He is the epitome. Look what he did in relating to you, in relating to me. Look what Christ did. Look what he did. And he's the epitome of everything Paul has just told us to be. Selfless. Willing to exalt others above ourselves. Meek. Humble. He was the epitome of all of those things. Anybody in this room tonight got a problem with what Christ has done for you? Anybody got a problem with Christ tonight? I don't. I cherish this relationship that I have with Christ. Look what he did to make this relationship possible. Look what he does to continue to maintain, perpetuate the relationship we have between us. The Bible says we are to be implementing those things in our relationships. That sacrifice, that selflessness, that love, that oneness of mind, of doctrine, that all, all exist in our relationships. Christ is our example that we always look to. Whenever we forget, whenever we forget how we relate one to another, look at Christ and how he's related to the entire world. And that'll do the trick that we should show them. And we think about Christianity and how beautiful it is. And is there any other way that you want to live? Is there any other way that you could even consider?
conceptualize living. I mean, I, I'm at a juncture in my life where I can't even think about living in another way. I couldn't conceptualize being outside of Christ. I can't even imagine not being a Christian. And it's a joyous existence. And one of the clouds to be able to look forth the hope of heaven. If you're here tonight and and it's the case that you're not a child of God, you're not a member of God's family yet. You have not been obedient to the gospel. Perhaps you've got to hear the gospel. It's God's power to save us. Romans 116. You've got to believe it. Because belief is necessary. Without it, we'll be damned. Mark 16, verse number 16. You've got to repent of sin. There are some things that we, we have come to think. There are some habits that we have brought into our lives. There are some things that we do, some, some sentiments that we have that, that have to be changed. The Bible uses the word repentance. And that word in the Greek language is metanois. Meta meaning change, noise meaning mind. Repentance is a change of mind. It ultimately leads to a change of action. Bible says necessary in 13 verse 3. God who confess the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that He is the Son of God, because He is, and the evidence replete internally and externally. We'll talk about the Bible. My friends, we've got to be baptized. We have our sins washed away in the blood of Christ. You know, I had somebody ask me one time. I was uh, having a discussion with a denominational about baptism, and of course they're saying, no, baptism is not necessary. Salvation, I'm saying, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we're looking at some scriptures in the text, and when we're looking at these scriptures, it says baptism is absolutely necessary for our salvation. Finally, the guy would ask me, well, what's in the water? What's in the water? In other words, what's so significant about the water? But the way he asked the question was, what's in the water? I said, you know, I wasn't the greatest science student, but I believe it's hydrogen and oxygen. I think that's what was in it. The point is this. Who cares what's in the water? God said, get in the water. Because that is where I will apply the blood of my son to your soul and not in another place, my friends. The people argue in vain against the dictates of God. The people ask what we need to do to get these sins off our souls in Acts 2.37. Peter says, repent and be baptized. Everyone is in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's how it's done. God will add us to his church. Acts 2, 41 and 47. We live together in harmony as God's children, loving one another, relishing in these relationships that God has allowed us to formulate in Christ. If we can help you tonight, we want to do so. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, please come and let's together stand and sing. I